Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Illumine our hearts, O Mass, to the love of mankind, pure light of thy divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds to the understanding of thy gospel teaching. Implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down all carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things as are well pleasing unto thee, for thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies of Christ our God, and for thee we ascribe glory, together with thy Father, who is from everlasting, and thy all holy good and life giving spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Welcome everyone. Thanks for being here. We're sitting right down to the last couple of sessions for this year's class. And today we're going to continue talking about the theological dangers, the spiritual dangers of um, theology. And last week we talked about some of the dangers. Today we're going to talk about the danger of obsession and judging God. And she says sometimes people obsess over theological and or biblical issues. Yeah. <clears throat> In which they're uh, in their own minds they believe must be resolved. They read something in the uh, scriptures and they say mm, i don't like this i have to figure out what's wrong and so they continue they this state the problem and they're not pondering the problem so they're convinced that they've arrived and accepted by uh, according to their own reasoning and usually this concerns a passage in the bible Often Genesis and the creation accounts, or in the uh, account of the book of Joshua, where there's a lot of violent killings when the Israelites came back into Canaan, and there were tribes that they had to overcome, and the descriptions are quite violent, and people have problems with that. I will say when I went back and looked at some of the passages in Joshua, the tribes that fought against the Israelites, usually there was a problem. There were some cities who didn't give the Israelites a problem and they continued on. And so it wasn't like they killed everyone in their path, but particularly the Amalekites, the Hittites, certain different cities uh, they had a lot of uh, trouble and God was with the Israelites and he did help them overcome their resistance so this is a particularly difficult section in the Bible and obviously some of it's very violent and when you see icons of, of the prophet Joshua he is always had a sword and he has uh, you know in military uh, attire so it is, uh, you know, something that was part of his um, job, I guess. Uh, he was the successor to Moses as far as leading the Israelites. Quite a colorful too. It is. It is. And uh, he became the, the leader that lead, led the Israelites into the land of Canaan. Now, she says, we can really never understand this or find any explanation that will satisfy our modern minds because our minds have been shaped according to Christian values, uh, which did not exist at that time. But we have to begin with the presumption that God is loving and just, and that we humans cannot understand his ways and are in no position to judge God. And we have to accept that, uh, that there are things that we cannot simply understand. One of the problems with the Hebrews, with Israelites, is that the Canaanites around them that they did not overcome ended up influencing them and helping them turn away from God 
and start to, to worship pagan, their own pagan gods. So every time the Israelites came, went away from God, it's because they were influenced by their neighbors. And so one of the reasons why uh, God said, you know, conquer these people is because otherwise they're going to lead you away from me and you're going to end up having more difficulties. And we see this with, with uh, later on with some of the kings with Ahab, with Jezebel, and, you know, the prophet Elijah has to bring them back to, to God. So it was a continual struggle. So the problem is in, in our modern times, an obsession can become a spiritual problem because it's a trap of the devil designing, uh, designed to plant seeds of doubt in our minds about God. And so he, he gets us fixated on something that we cannot solve. And we start to doubt God's goodness and his um, uh, wanting our salvation. Obsession distracts us from what is truly important and spiritually useful. It can ultimately lead us to lose our faith. And she says this kind of obsession is really ego driven. Sometimes our own ego says, you know, I've got to do this for myself. And it's not really that important in the overall idea of salvation. So countless people have been disturbed by the violence in the Old Testament. After 3,000 years, nobody's really arrived at a satisfactory explanation that will make us comfortable with certain parts of the Bible. But an obsessed person will be determined to find out what the solution is. Example here is, is the Battle of Jericho. Uh, we know this from the, um, from the uh, uh, Old Testament. And the walls of the city of Jericho uh, came down and killed many of the people. Because there was... Oh, so, um, and, the, and the people of Jericho were, were very uh, much against the Israelites. If they had not uh, worked against them, they probably would have been left alone. Who are these two guys in the front? This is Joshua kneeling down, and that's the angel of the Lord who is helping the Israelites. Uh, I'm looking at Joshua. He looks like he's got wings on his back, too. But, uh, no, that's actually his cape. Okay. The angel looks like he's got a lightsaber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, force, the force is with him. <laughs> so this type of problem that these people have really requires spiritual intervention. It cannot be resolved by applying one's own mind. They really need you know, prayer and uh, you know, spiritual uh, guidance and, and over to overcome that. Now, God allowed actions in the Old Testament that he does not accept in the New Testament. He expects more from us today than he did from the ancient and primitive peoples. Our theological and moral understandings and God's expectations for our behavior grow over time. And a good, good example is St. Gregory, the theologian, said that the Holy Trinity was not clearly manifested in the Old Testament because it would have been a burden to those people at that time. They wouldn't be able to receive it. But gradually over time, the truth became manifest, obviously with Jesus Christ coming, becoming man, and the Holy Spirit came to dwell in the apostles according to their capacity to receive him. And so the Holy Spirit was not really re revealed until Jesus came, the second person of the Holy Trinity, and spoke the words he did, uh, did the things he did, and was crucified and rose from the dead. Then he said, I will send you the Holy Spirit. And then the Trinity was revealed to the, to the uh, apostles. And so you can see how the knowledge of God grew with time, with God's revelation. St. John Chrysostom says, let us accept what is said with much gratitude, not overstepping the proper limit or busying ourselves with matters beyond our understanding. This is the besetting weakness of enemies of the truth, wishing as they do to assign every matter to their own reasoning and lacking the realization that it's beyond the capacity of human nature to um, 
God's creation. And so even a man like St. Jack Chrysostom, who was, you know, well-versed in theology, says, really, we can't understand everything. Don't try to go beyond it. So don't obsess over that. Now, St. Cyril of Alexandria had a similar approach when he discussed Christ's healing of the blind man born blind, who we'll hear next Sunday in the gospel uh, reading. When the disciples asked the Lord why the man was born blind, Jesus replies that the works of God might be made manifest in him. Okay. Well, some people say, well, if even that was the case for this man, because he would be healed by Christ, why would he have to suffer his whole life with blindness? Or is this fair? Or what about other people who are born with infirmities or illnesses who are never healed? And so people bring up these questions and, and they sort of get focused in on that. Well, St. Cyril says the response that Christ gave that the works of God might be manifest. He, the reason he said that is he was deflecting the disciples question and ascribing this knowledge to God alone. We cannot understand why people suffer through no fault of their own. Only God knows. We don't know why that reason is. If we start to focus on that, we lose sight of the fact that God wants what is best for everyone for our salvation. And we may never understand why that is in, in, in this lifetime. And I'm sure we've known people who have suffered, uh, people in our own families, and we say, you know, why is God doing this or why does this happen? We don't know, but we still have to understand that God is a loving and just God, and he does want the best for everyone. So likewise, many other matters for us are above our ability to contemplate and understand them, St. Cyril says. He advises us to accept what is most often most difficult for us, and that is we can't explain everything. We can only trust that God is good and then be silent. We must not try to understand what is beyond us seeking rational explanations to satisfy human sensibilities. So, any questions or comments as far as I mean it's it's a it's an important subject and you know we deal with it in our lives and I think the author's trying to kind of give us a perspective on this as to why this happens but we need to get beyond that. I didn't want to say that it makes full sense when I look back since I become Orthodox and I look at scriptures and look back at church history and stuff, not just Orthodox church history, but just Christianity in general, it seems like any time some new theology popped up through history is because someone did exactly this, a succession, mm -hmm. you know, and instead of accepting, like the Orthodox church says, that there's mysteries that we can't understand because of our finite human limitations, you know, we just have to accept them and trust God, and when they pursue, like the first thing that comes to my mind is like Calvinism. Yeah. It's such an absurd premise <laughs> in sure. my mind. You know that some are, some are already going to be saved, and some aren't. You know, like Christ never right. said that ever. Right. You know, and I, I just, it just seems to me like when, when someone tries to pursue like this, that's it really is a pitfall, and it can lead lots of people into that pit. Exactly, exactly. And that's why when people, for instance, in, pre, in Calvinism, predeterminism, if you're not one of the chosen, you know, then what happens? You just you just live life as immorally as possible because I'm going matter. to hell anyway. It doesn't matter. Right? Yeah. So it is, it is, it's, it's uh, it can lead to a lot of heresies. The next thing uh, she talked about is the danger of conformity, compromise, and cowardice. And she says, this is really one of the most common things that we Christians in, in the common era have to face uh, because of uh, our, the pressure to compromise our values, conform to social norms, or at least be silent. And she says that the root of all this is cowardice. It's really fear of social disapproval, ostracism, or the loss of a job or career if we speak the truth. 
And I showed this picture of the prophet Joshua because if you see, I don't know if you can read it in, in the scroll, he's only said, be strong and courageous and do not be cowardly or fearful uh, for the Lord is with you in all, uh, wherever you go. And so just like the ancient Israelites faced a lot of resistance and he showed courage in the face of that resistance, it kind of speaks to us now in our current uh, environment is that we do have to show courage and especially in the resistance that we face in our own uh, social environment. And because of this, we're tempted to soften the moral teaching to the church in the name of compassion. We compromise our own values or fail to speak the truth without hesitating, wavering, or vacillating. And we see this almost every day now in our current society. Uh, the world says, lighten up, Christians. You know, there's you don't need to be so strict on your moral standards. And, you know, we cannot really compromise on these things. And you can see that the danger manifests itself when ordinary Christians and theologians alike are confronted with all these moral issues. We have abortion, we have homosexuality, heterosexual couples have cohabitating, multiple marriages, immodest clothing, violent video games, the music videos and the lyrics, uh, popular television shows with and movies with explicit uh, Scenes, gambling, vanity, obsession with physical beauty is a big one. You know, you, you look at these uh, advertisements and every second one is how you make yourself beautiful, love of money, and then bad language just falling into our uh, everyday conversation. And she said the list goes on and on. So these are all things that, like the Israelites, when they were exposed to the paganism of the Canaanites, you know, there was a lot of pressure to be like them, and we are facing some of these same things. Christ and the apostles warned us against not being of the world. St. Paul, in fact, wrote uh, many times against sexual immorality and any manners of sin. So the very idea of choosing a life of holiness, like, like we try to pursue in orthodoxy, uh, rather than the pursuit of pleasure and self judgment, it just foreign to the popular culture of our time. People think you're crazy if you try to live a holy and, and moral life. So no rational explanation can ever justify or condone immorality because orthodoxyology is not a matter of clever philosophical arguments. Some, you know, modern Christians will come up with good excuses for why we can lighten up our moral standards and they'll come up with very clever arguments saying well if you really look at it this way jesus really didn't mean this or the church needs to modernize it's stuck in the old morality and it's, we have to get more modern and we see this in some of the other christian uh, um, groups christians are called not to conform to this world but to transform into something holy and acceptable to God. And as, as St. Paul says, become a living sacrifice. We can never justify sin regardless of, of social pressure. And then St. Paul says in Romans, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And that's really what it is. You, you, your mind, where your mind is, is where your morality is going to be. And so we need to be transformed, not of this world, but beyond that. And when he says live in sacrifice, you really sacrifice your own will and your own desires and make them conform to what God's will is. And God's will is what Jesus Christ preached when he came. And Jesus warned his followers that they would be hated and rejected by the world just like he was. He said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. Because if you were like the world, they would love you. And we see that all the time. When, when you conform to the world, 
you're you're glorified, you're celebrity, but they hate you if you don't conform to it. If the church becomes secularized and conforms to the value and meets uh, these things because of social needs, it can't offer anything different. It can't offer spiritual healing or transformation because it's in, uh, encouraging to humanity to remain in its fallen state. And that's what the message of, of, uh, of Satan is. He's it, saying, you know, don't conform, stay in this fallen state that I have humanity in. And uh, it's, a, it's a battle. It's what they call the spiritual warfare that we go through in our lives and uh, in fighting against us. Our duty is not to be popular not to make concessions, not to compromise, not to prove that we're loving or open-minded. How many times have we heard this in our society? Oh, you're too close-minded. You're not tolerant enough. And, but we, if we do that, we don't present the option of spiritual transformation. Then there's no other alternative. People say, oh, there's no reason to be uh, a good, loving Christian person. And so the Christ, the, the words of Christ himself, such as love one another and judge not, the people of the world turn them against us. And they say, well, you're not being loving or you're not supposed to judge us. And so they turn it around on us and, they, and we become ashamed and silent simply to, because we express our moral values. And we've seen this a lot. So the admonition of Christ to judge not lest you be judged, has been employed as a weapon to shame, chastise, and even bully any Christian who doesn't conform to societal norms and promote immorality. But the command to judge not doesn't mean that we Christians are not to make judgments about whether a behavior is right or wrong. We must distinguish between right and wrong. So when they say that, oh, you're being judgmental, they're not really correct. Judge not means that we're not to condemn another person, since only God is judge alone. It's not an order never to acknowledge that an act is a sin. You see the difference there? You can condemn the sin, but not condemn the sinner. You can point out the sin, but you don't say you're going to hell. Only God okay. can judge who's going where. But you can still say this act is sinful and doing this is sinful. And that's the difference. Judge not means, and even the, 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 the Bible says, if you see someone sinning, don't condemn the sinner and don't judge him. Judge yourself, but don't judge him. But still bring out the fact that there's a sin being committed. St. Paul had said that admonish the sinner, but in a loving manner. So that's the difference. And so when somebody says you're being judgmental, you can say, yes, I judge what you're doing is sinful. I don't condemn you, but I will tell you, reform, repent, and do not continue that sinful act. But don't let them turn it down around on us. We must stand firm in that that is the case. And so she goes on saying in a pluralistic society that, that we're living in that opposes the phronema or the mentality of our church and appeals to the distorted Christian ethic as well as limited reasoning. It's a challenge for, for all of us, not just for theologians, for all of us to deal with that. So Christ calls us to be a light to the world and not to place our light under a bushel. We should be strict with ourselves, but gentle with others. And that's the, that's the key strictly judge ourselves we can condemn ourselves and say what i'm doing is wrong and i need to repent but we need to be gentle when we when we deal with other people again condemn the sinner but don't condemn this condemn the sin excuse me but not the sinner however and then this is a point she brings out we will answer for leading others astray because we sought to curry favor with people rather than speak the truth of God. So if you want to be nice and not hurt somebody's feelings, 
without telling them the truth, you also, there's a balance there. If you see someone sinning, you must say something without necessarily condemning them, because if you continue to tolerate that behavior uh, and they trust you, then you might end up having to answer for that at some point. So we can never condone immorality, but it doesn't mean we have to be preachy, combative, or antagonistic. We must simply say the truth, stand for it, even if we have to endure social, personal, or financial consequences. And quite frankly, in today's cancel culture, if you say something that uh, is against people who are in power, you may suffer financial, you may lose your job, you may lose your friends and things like that. So it can be dangerous at times for ourselves. We can expect persecution for being Christ's followers. And she says, we should rejoice if we're found worthy to suffer for Jesus' name. God forbid that we choose to love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And finally, Christ will be ashamed of us and will, will be, we will be rejected by him just as we are ashamed and rejected him. And he says in, in the gospel, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my father who's in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my father who is in heaven. And so that's say, a challenge for us and then finally, he says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and the Holy Angel. So at the second coming, if we have succumbed to the world, we have to then accept that if we reject Christ now, he will not know us in, in, in the next kingdom. Any other questions or comments up to this point? Well, someone who did not reject Christ and who not, was not ashamed of him is the woman we will um, commemorate today in the fifth Sunday of Pascha, and that's the Samaritan woman, uh, the woman at the well. Uh, she's known as Saint Fotini in the Greek uh, tradition as Svetlana in the Slavonic tradition. And uh, her icon is actually in our church. It's, I think, on the north wall of one of the medallions. And it's St. Fatini. And she is the woman at the well. We'll talk about her uh, in the remaining time today. Because we know what happened in the gospel account of, of John. That uh, we're very familiar that uh, the New Testament describes the account of the woman at the well who was a Samaritan. Up to the point where she met Jesus at the well, she had led a sinful life, one which resulted in a rebuke from Jesus Christ himself. He says, go call your husband. She says, I have no husband. He says, you're, you're right, you don't have no, you've had five. And in fact, you're living with someone who's not your husband now. And she's rebuked by Jesus, but she repented. She responded to Christ's stern admonition with a genuine repentance, was forgiven her sinful ways and became a convert to Christian faith, taking the name Fotini at baptism, which literally means the enlightened one. And, uh, and again, she's another example of, of great repentance in the church, like David the prophet, like uh, St. Peter after he den uh, denied Christ three times. Uh, St. Fortini is an example of repentance of you know, bad, how bad a sinner she was. She uh, repented, accepted Christ's words, and became actually a great evangelist. Uh, she became a significant figure in what they call the Johannine community. In other words, the community that followed St. John the, God, uh, the evangelist, and like many other women, contributed to the spread of Christianity. She therefore occupies a place of honor among the apostles 
in Greek sermons from the fourth to the 14th century, she is actually called an apostle and an evangelist. And in the icon here, it says St. Fotini equal to the apostles. And in the sermons, the Samaritan woman is often compared to the male disciples and the apostle have been found to surpass them even. Uh, later in the Byzantine uh, tradition, the uh, biographers developed the story of her uh, beginning where St. John's gospel left off. And so we know that she went to the city. She told the people, uh, come and see someone who has told me everything I've ever done. They come to the whole city comes. And in fact, they accept Jesus. And unlike some of the other places where Jesus went and they said, go away, like you know, the Gadarenes, they said, please stay. And, and he stayed two days and, and spoke to them about Christianity. And so at Pentecost, St. Fotini received baptism along with her five sisters. And, and we have their names, Anatoly, Foto, Fotis, Paraskiva, and Kiriaki, and her two sons, Fotinios and Joseph. And so not only herself, but her whole family was baptized at Pentecost. And then she began her missionary career, traveling far and wide, preaching the good news of the Messiah's coming, his death and resurrection. <clears throat> when Nero, the emperor, began to persecute Christians, and this was in the latter part of the first century, Potini and her son Joseph were in Carthage in North Africa, and she was preaching the gospel there at that time. Then Jesus appeared to Fotini in a dream, and she sailed to Rome. And her son, along with many Christians from Africa, accompanied her. And she arrived in the city of Rome, and the activity, when she came, it aroused a lot of curiosity and a lot of uh, excitement. Everybody talked about her and saying, who is this woman? And they asked, she came here with a crowd of followers, and she preaches Christ with great boldness. And so you can imagine this woman who was uh, transformed her whole life, not just repented of her sins, but became a strong creature of the message in the face of even ex extreme persecutor like Nero. Soldiers were ordered. So this, all of a sudden, all this excitement becomes, uh, comes to the attention of the emperor, and he orders soldiers to bring her uh, to the palace. But Fotini anticipated them before they could arrest her. Fotini with her son Joseph and her Christian friends went to Nero himself. And the emperor saw them. He asked why they had come. And she answered, We have come to teach you, Nero, to believe in Christ. The half mad ruler of the Roman Empire did not frighten her. She wanted to convert him. Imagine. How the courage, you know, you talk about Joseph or Joshua, the, the prophet, and he said, have courage. Here's one, here's an example of, of a, a woman who came and in the faith, and he's a known persecutor of Christians now. So this guy, he's killing Christians left and right. And she comes and she says, I want to convert you, Nero. Well, he didn't take too kindly to that. And he, he, he says, what are your names? And she tells him her name. She names all of her sisters and her son. He been demanded to know, are you all ready to die for this Jesus of Nazareth? And they said, she said, yes. For the love of him, we rejoice. And in his name, we will gladly die. And this is something we have to remember in the early uh, Christian uh, evangelists and apostles. They knew in some way that they were going to be facing death. But in the face of that, they still had the courage to not deny Christ. So hearing their defiant words, Nero ordered their hands beaten with iron rods for three hours. And imagine at the end of every hour, another persecutor took up the beating. And here are these persecutors and they're, they're beating all these people and the persecutors themselves are getting tired. So they have to change shifts, so to speak. However, the count says that 
the saints felt no pain and nothing happened to their hands. And I've read this in the account of many of the saints. They are tortured and they don't feel the pain. Some do, but many times they don't feel the pain. And it's a miracle. It's a miracle of God that he protects, protects his saints when this happens. So Fotini, during all of this, quote, quoted joyfully the words of the psalmist David, God is my help. No matter what anyone does to me, I shall not be afraid. So this really perplexes the emperor. He doesn't know what to do. He cannot understand their endurance and their confidence. So he ordered the men thrown into prison. And the, uh, Fotini and her five sisters were brought to a golden reception hall in the imperial palace. There, the six women were seated on golden thrones. In front of them, they had a big golden table with coins, jewels, and dresses. He hoped to tempt the women by this display of wealth and luxury. Imagine, he says, okay, I can't beat you in this submission. I'm going to buy you with all of this gold and with these dresses and everything. And then he orders his own daughter, whose name was Domnina, with her slave girls, with her servants, to go and speak with the Christian women. Women, he thought, would succeed in persuading their Christian sisters to deny their God. So he says, well, if I can't talk you into it, I'm going to bring these women in. And I'm sure they'll be able to convince you, especially with all this gold and with all this wealth. Well, Domnina comes, she greets Fotini graciously, she, and she mentions the name of Christ herself. And so this is an opening for Fotini. She sees that Domnina is actually possibly receptive to the message of Christ. And on hearing the princess's greeting, the saint thanked God. She embraced and kissed Domnina, and the women talked, but the outcome of the women's talk was not what Nero had expected. <laughs> Domnina catechized, uh, I'm sorry, Fotini catechized Domnina and her hundred slave girls and baptized them. She gave the name Anthusa to Nero's daughter. After her baptism, Anthusa immediately ordered all the gold and jewels on the table to be distributed to the core of Rome. And uh, here's an icon of actually uh, St. Anthusa, and she became a saint in the church herself. I think she was martyred uh, shortly after that. I, when I looked at the sources, I couldn't directly see that she was martyred, but she's holding a cross in her hand. So I think uh, he was such a madman that he even you know killed his own daughter, which is not unknown, by the way, in the early church. Uh, when Christ said, uh, parent will be turned against child and and brother against sister, et cetera, et cetera. This happened in the early church. Uh, some of the early Christians who were, their whole family wasn't uh, converted, sometimes parents <laughs> even killed their own children because of their hatred of Christ. Oh, this can happen. But at any rate, when the emperor heard that his own daughter had been converted to Christianity, he condemned Fotini and all her companions to death by fire. I mean, he's tried everything now and he still can't kill them. For seven days, the furnace burned, but when the door of the furnace was opened, it was seen that fire had not harmed the saints. And this harkens back to the three holy youths in Babylon with the same idea. Their faithfulness had saved them from this fire. Next, the empire, emperor tried to destroy the saints with poison. I mean, he's running out of ways to kill them. And he's, Fotini says, I'll drink it first. I'll be the first one to drink this, that you might see the power of my Christ and our God. And all the saints then drank the poison after her. Uh, none suffered any ill effects from it. In, in vain, Nero subjected Fotini to many different tortures after that. And, and the accounts that I've read, uh, very horrible tortures. None of them worked. The saints were then thrown into prison uh, for three years. So they were held in a Roman prison, and St. Fortini transformed it into literally a, a church, a house of God. 
Many Romans came to the prison and were converted and baptized. <laughs> and so everything he tried worked against them. You see the, you see the ways of the Lord, how, how he does this with those who are faithful. Finally, enraged at the tyrant had all the saints except for Fortini beheaded. And this usually happens is when, it, when they try everything and they cannot uh, destroy the saints, not convert them to deny Christ, they finally have them beheaded. So everyone except Fortini, she was thrown into a deep uh, well uh, and then in prison. Now, by this time, she was grieved that she was alone. Uh, all of those around her had been martyred and uh, as well as her family. And so night and day, she prayed for release from this life. One night, God appeared to her, made the sign of the cross over her three times. And the division filled her with joy. Many days later, while she uh, hymned and blessed God, she also was beheaded and gave her uh, soul in her hands to God. In Constantinople, following this uh, Many years later, there were two churches dedicated to St. Fortini, where many miracles occurred, especially the healing of eye disease. And uh, at, up to this point, at this time, the head of St. Fortini is kept at the Gregorio Monastery on Mount Athos. And so uh, her relic is there. And so, in, yeah, yeah, it's still in the. Uh, it's kept as a sacred relic in the monastery. So in conclusion, uh, the account I read says the Samaritan woman conversed with Christ by the well of Jacob near the city of Sikar. She drank from the living water and gained everlasting life and glory. For generation after generation, Orthodox Christians have addressed this prayer to the woman exalted by the Messiah when he sat by the well in Samaria and talked with her. And the prayer, illumined by the Holy Spirit, all glorious one, from Christ the Savior, you drank the water of salvation. With an open hand, you gave it to those who thirst, great martyr Fortini, equal to the apostles, pray to Christ for the salvation of our souls. And so that's the story of St. Fortini. We will hear the account today in, the, in today's gospel. And uh, what, a, what a great woman, what a great uh, evangelist and martyr that we have. And so you can see why she's commemorated in this possible season. You know, if you understand, if you know the, the early uh, church, the people were converted and baptized in, on Pascha. And now we have these lessons every Sunday of the great teaching that the church gives us. Any other comments, any additions? All right, well, thanks everyone. Thanks very much. You're welcome. The finale next Sunday for the, the last class. Very cool. Thanks everyone. <laughs>